So today's day and age, we collect, we collect, we share, and we exchange tremendous amount of information, of personal information. And it's ever rising. It's ever increasing, and it will increase further. Um, this guide, this, this workshop is, um, the purpose of this workshop is to give you ideas, to give you to educate more about what your data is, how can you protect it, what kind of data is taken from you when you're browsing online, when you're using your applications, when, and how to protect your devices against third parties. Um, so first, before we, uh, before we move into that, we have to understand the threat model that we are facing. Uh, we need to identify who is trying to um, use our data, uh, who is trying to, um, and, and that can be anyone from various organizations, let's say Facebook, Twitter, um, other companies that, that we willingly share our data with. Uh, it can be criminals that can use this data to uh, to blackmail us, right? To to demand ransom for our data, or they could steal our financial information or personal identity, and they can pretend to be us. Um, there's also government, and we know for a fact, and and not just Georgian government or any. Uh, any one government, but any government in the entire world. So, because the internet has no borders, and therefore any government can uh, can eavesdrop on your activity. They can all uh, uh, they are all interested in your data. Um, and we know for a fact that, for example, in Georgia, we've had uh, that uh, that mass surveillance has been an issue for since we uh, since we became a democracy, right? Since we had the internet, since we had uh, our personal data, that has become a very lucrative piece for for governments to to track and to use uh, against its citizens. Um, now, I strongly believe that the privacy should not need uh, a lot of uh, trade-offs. You should not uh, sacrifice your own comfort or your usability of applications in order to have privacy. You, uh, and the good rule to, to achieve that is to use 80-20 rule, right? Where 20% uh, of your actions contribute to 80% of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the results, right? And, and if you just do... Uh, if, if you just do just enough to secure your data. You don't have to go crazy about it. You don't have to stop using internet, right? You don't have to start secure uh, every single device that you own. You just have to secure just enough so that you're not an easy target. Let's see how, how government surveillance works, right? How mass surveillance works. They throw a wide net over the internet and they try to catch ev every, anyone. And if you are not an easy target, then you are outside of that net. Uh, let's start with the web browsers. Web browsers are probably the, the, the majority of time we spend on the internet, we probably use web browsers. And web browsers are uh, giving away some personal information when, we do, when, you, when you browse, uh, when you use it. And there are different browsers, right? There are closed source uh, browsers and open source browsers. What does it mean? It means that the closed source browsers, uh, the code of the browser is closed. We cannot see it. We cannot lo look inside and see what it's doing. Uh, and for open source browsers, we can actually uh, see the code. It's public for anyone to see. And even if you don't know how to read code, there are engineers that will, and they will, uh, uh, they will tell you about it. If, if they will file a report, if there's some kind of issue, privacy issue or security issue, and they will try to fix that issue or report it to the maintainers. Or if the maintainers refuse to fix those issues, they will make it a news story, and you'll read about it. Uh, we have um, uh, common browsers, most popular ones uh, are Google Chrome, Safari, Edge, and Opera. And those are all closed source browsers. And three of them are actually using an open source browser. They're based on open source browser that is Chromium. Uh, and we also have, in open source browsers, we have Firefox and we have Brave. Now, Brave is also based on Chromium, but it is fully open source. It just builds uh, on top of the Chromium to give you better privacy, to forget, to protect you against fingerprinting. 
Um, and it generally has good uh, defaults for your privacy. Uh, now, what is browser fingerprinting? So we, the similarly to your fingerprint that you have on your finger, uh, the browsers are sending some pieces of information to the websites that you visit that can be uniquely, uh, can be together uh, data points that can uniquely identify you, even if you didn't send them any kind of identifiable information. Now, what are those? Um, so whenever you visit a website, uh, the, the browser sends the browser and its version to, to the website that you're visiting. It sends an operating system that you're using. It sends a list of installed plugins. For example, if you have a plugin that is uh, for reading the PDF documents in your browser, that is uh, one of the plugins. Time zone, uh, screen size, list of installed fonts, hardware information, and browser language. Now, any single one of those is not, um, it's not a personally identifiable information, right? It's, it cannot be used. Like, for example, a browser in its version, there are probably millions of people that have the same browser and the same, um, uh, same version, an operating system for that matter. Um, but when it starts to change is when you combine all these pieces of information that you get the, uh, you, you can narrow it down uh, very, you can really narrow it down. So you add a list of installed plugins and then you have, um, at this point, you already narrowed it down a lot. And then when you add time zone, you are sending uh, Asia Tbilisi to the website. And when that happens, you, you already have a list of 3,700,000 people. That's a, that's a pretty short list in, in, in the worldwide uh, scale. Uh, then you factor in screen size and list of installed fonts. That's one of the uh, most critical places where, for example, if you just install a single font, you can differ from, differ from almost anyone. If you have a unique combination of fonts, you can differ from, from anyone on the planet. Um, and hardware information. Sometimes some websites can read uh, information about your uh, graphics card. What kind of graphics card do you have? And it can send a request to the graphics card uh, telling it to render some image. And every single graphic card will uniquely, uh, will render the image uniquely. That will, that will be unique to you. So let's say you are, um, let's say you give, you, you signed up on one website. Uh, and you gave them your full name, uh, your address, your, your other personal details. Uh, and then you signed up on the other website where you didn't give them any, any, any of that information. Now, if these two websites share information with each other, now it's very easy to identify you because they will just make your fingerprint and they will compare it against the database that they share with the other website. Um, there's also data synchronization. Uh, it's it's a, a comfort feature in, in most browsers that gives you a way to synchronize all of your browsing history, your bookmarks, and passwords. Um, for example, uh, the most popular one, Google Chrome, does that. Uh, and all of that information is stored on uh, the company servers. Right, You're giving all of this information to, to Google, to a third party. Please don't <laughs> stop doing that if you're doing it. Uh, it's, it's not a good idea uh, because, well, you, you, your passwords, uh, now, if you, if you gave that data, even though Google says you, tells you that it's encrypted, uh, it's encrypted by your password, and they can just reset your password and then read all of that information. So don't do that. Uh, there is a good alternative to all of this, right? We have uh, a browser, Brave, uh, and together with the uBlock Origin, that is a browser extension that blocks ads and trackers, that can give you a good enough privacy and the comfort level that you have with Google Chrome if you are a user of that. Uh, it has a fingerprinting protection. It will generate some random numbers instead of uh, your device information. Uh, it has very sane defaults for your privacy. So maybe you're not very um, uh, tech savvy, right? And if that's the case, then it can be hard to navigate those settings and then figure out the correct settings uh, for your for a better privacy. And Brave does give you a good default that is just 
that just works. It won't break any, any of your experience. It will be the same experience that you have with Google Chrome. Uh, you can also have the same synchronization that you have in Google Chrome, but you can encrypt it with your own passphrase, and it is only shared between your devices. Now, that will be sent to the servers that the Brave owns, but it will be encrypted. It will never leave your device without being encrypted first. So nobody will, will be able to read it. Um, and yeah, as I said, there's no hit to usability and comfort. It, it will provide you the same exact comfort that you have with Google Chrome or any other Chromium-based browser for that matter. And uh, if you are going to use uBlock Origin, as I said, that's an extension that will block the advertisements and tracking and various tracking uh, online. You and you are using that in, in Georgia, you're frequently browsing Georgian websites, make sure to uh, turn on easy privacy and uh, rule at least filter in there because that also contains some Georgian uh, websites, uh, tracking websites that will be blocked. And there's also Firefox. Uh, it, didn't, uh, it was not my top choice because I don't know a lot of people that use Firefox. I personally like Firefox, and it, it has a, a, a good amount of market share in the browsers. But it's different from, it might be different from your experience. There's also Tor, Tor browser that will give you a great anonymity, but it will be very hard to use it. If you're used to Google Chrome and Chromium-based browsers, it will be very hard for you to use, but it's a good idea. If you want to, you can use Tor Browser, you can use Firefox with a special setting that will resist fingerprinting enabled. Um, let's move on to secure communication. Now, the most lucrative piece of our data is our communication with our friends, with our relatives, with our coworkers. Uh, we, we share uh, our, our the way we talk, the way we communicate with people has shifted from real life to, to the digital space, and even more so during the pandemic. And that information, that communication, that the media files that you share with your friends and relatives, uh, it is the most lucrative piece. You are sharing very personal information there that you believe that is only intended for the recipient and not anyone else. Uh, but let's... let's uh, what happens when we share, when we text someone uh, through Facebook Messenger, for example? What happens is that uh, in Facebook Messenger, we, Facebook has this access to the message that we send to the third party, to, to, to the recipient. They can, they can keep it forever. Uh, it's never deleted. And, uh, for example, if government asks for Facebook to give away the information, they will give it away, even if you deleted that information for yourself. That's still stored on the Facebook servers, and they, Facebook can use this data to give you better ads, but also to, but also to, to sell your data. And, and we know for a fact that hey, Facebook has been selling data, and we, we know that the privacy, Facebook had privacy issues. For example, Cambridge Analytica, where uh, data of millions of users has been shared with uh, the third party. Um, and we need a better way. We need a better way, and a better way is end-to-end -end encryption. So what end-to-end -end encryption means is that only me and the recipient has, has the ability to read the message. Nobody in between the service provider that gives us the, this encrypted communication will not be able to read it. And if government comes asking uh, the provider, please give me the data of this user, they will be able to just give the, the garbage data that, that is unreadable by anyone but the recipient and the sender. Um, sometimes you have to trust the provider that they are actually encrypting the data. When the application is closed source, for example, for example, WhatsApp is a closed source application that uh, tells us that it's end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, but we have to trust it because it's closed source. Nobody can actually verify it. Nobody can see the source code. Nobody can check it. So we have to trust it. And do you trust Facebook with your privacy? Do you trust Facebook that they will tell you the truth? I personally don't. Uh, and I don't think that you have to trust someone uh, for their word. I think that you can the, the, making someone open source is a better way to, to earn that trust. Show me your code and I'll trust you. That's the way it works. Uh, if I see the code, if I see that you're not doing any, anything malicious, I, I see that it is actually end-to-end -end encrypted, then I will trust you. Not on your word, but on your actual application code. Um, it is also important for you to... Um, 
for the application to protect you from yourself. For example, Facebook has a, a, a way for you to, s to send end-to-end -end encrypted messages that the future is called secure chats, I believe. I don't know anyone who has used that chat, well, at least with me, uh, that feature, because it's not a default. You're not going to get, go out of your way to, to use that, uh, that feature to, to secure your communication. And it, I think that it should be a default. Uh, and also, well, we, we, can, we have to trust Facebook that it's actually uh, doing what, what it's saying it's doing. And same goes, for example, for Telegram. The default chats in Telegram are not end-to-end -end encrypted. The, the, the encryption keys are owned by Telegram. They store the keys, they have access to that keys, and they can decrypt the messages if they want to. They also have secure chats that are end-to-end -end encrypted. The Telegram won't be able to, to view it, but again, uh, it's not a default, so user can make an error. And if somebody texts you in, in, the, in the usual chat, non-encrypted chat, you'll just respond to them there. You're not going to open a second chat to, to respond there. And the, one of the most important points is that whenever I, I mention an application that I personally use, and I think that it is a good application for secure communication, I, I get questions like, well, is that is the another application better? Is, is, is Wire better? Is, is Thema better? Right? And um, well, my, question, my answer to that, that question is, well, do you know anyone who is using that except for you? Uh, so that, that is the biggest issue. I was, uh, um, I'm personally using Signal. Um, and I've been using Signal for since it was made, since it was called Text Secure. And at that time, it was very, very hard for pe to convince people to uh, to sw switch to Signal to Text Secure, um, because well, again, at that time, nobody was using it. Um, Signal is a is a good uh, alternative to any of your. Uh, any of your tools that you use for communication. It's end-to-end -end encrypted. It is encrypted by default. You don't have to go out of your way to, uh, to, to make the communication encrypted. Um, and everything there is actually encrypted. Not just your text, but your profile picture there, your username, your, your context list. Everything that you have there is end-to-end -end encrypted. It, it's, Signal does not have access to that data, and if the government no comes knocking, well, they have nothing, so they can give away nothing. Um, it is fully open source. Even the source code is open source. Uh, you can uh, read it in GitHub. Uh, it has been audited. Uh, and generally speaking, Signal is a, is a company, a very privacy-conscious privacy company that tries to, for example, deal with the servers. That is a company that tries to crack the phones and, and helps various governments to, to uh, break the encryption. And they are trying to create tools to, uh, to avoid their, their, their um, uh, hacking tools. It has sane secure defaults. Uh, anything set there is very sane and secure. Uh, and you can actually find your friends using it. So when you sign up on Signal, you can find that you can text uh, many of your friends right away. Um, and if you have no, have no friends that are on Signal, then it will be very easy for you to convince them to switch to it because they probably heard about it at least once. Um, and one of the good things that Signal has done is that they are trying to make application very usable. So it has all your regular things that you would see in, in Messenger, in WhatsApp, in Viber. It has your stickers, emojis, reactions to messages, and all these cool features that, that people like. Now, that, that has received, uh, Signal has received some criticism for, from security experts for, for adding those features, but uh, I think that it is important for you to it's not very important. So adding those features, yes, it creates a larger surface area. It creates more attack surface for, for others to, to break the applications. The, but the, if nobody's using it, then it's already broken, right? So it's better for the application to have those usability features. Uh, one of the notes, uh, uh, one of the suggestions that I want to make is to uh, enable registration lock on your Signal account. Uh, what that will do is, for example, if your phone number is stolen, right? Maybe, 
maybe someone got access to your SIM card or maybe someone uh, from the government just deactivated your SIM number and created a new one and now they can uh, act as, as you are act as, 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 as if they, they were you. Uh, if you enable registration lock, that will make it impossible for any attacker to do that because only you know the password. Also use disappearing messages in Signal. Uh, that's a really cool feature that, that you have there. And the, the messages will be deleted from all recipients' uh, devices whenever the time expires. You can set minutes, you can set weeks, or, or I, think, I believe the maximum is one month. Uh, and the messages will be deleted from anyone's device that you send it to. Um, and Try to avoid using desktop client if possible. Uh, your computers, your laptops are, uh, by default, they are not very secure. They, it, it's, uh, it's easy to, to make mistakes on your desktop browser. In your mobile home, you have, in your mobile phone, you have uh, a secure space there. Uh, all Android and iOS, they try to wrap the applications in their own shells where the, the external applications cannot access the data of another application, which is not necessarily true for, for uh, desktop operating systems. In, in, in Windows, in, in Linux, in, in Mac OS, it is possible for com applications to communicate with other applications and that could potentially uh, leak your signal information, signal data to, to third parties. Um, now let's uh, get into VPNs and, and just uh, network communication in general. Uh, VPNs are a way to hide your activity from your ISP, but also they, they hide your real IP address from the websites that you visit. Um, In a nutshell, how, how uh, communication works without a VPN is what you see here. So whenever you send a request from your browser, let's say you are searching something on Google, right? Uh, the, the request comes from the, uh, your computer. It says, uh, I want to visit google.com and I want to run something on google.com. And you can see that the, because we are using HTTPS here, the contents of the request are actually encrypted. So only Google and me can read this data that, that I just searched for. That would be different for if, uh, if it was HTTP, that would not be encrypted, but pretty much every website that you visit right now and that the most popular ones are already using HTTPS, so that communication will be secure. But the ISP, so internet service provider, they see that you try to access google.com and you, you send some kind of request to it. Uh, they can keep the logs of it. They can store uh, the exact time steps that when that happened. And if someone someone asks, they can just give away that information. And that has has happened to me. So you might think that you are the uh, you are not a criminal. You are a good citizen. You're not doing anything wrong. You're not making any crim criminal acts. But you might be at a wrong in a wrong place at a wrong time. And what may happen is that the government will not come knocking and ask you, well, you visit this website, give me your phone, I want to read it. And as that has actually happened to me. So I was looking for something on one of the government's websites. And what happened is that I clicked on one uh, location that I shouldn't have click clicked because it was a, a, a matter of investigation, interest of uh, investigation. So the government came knocking and they asked, well, give me a, your phone and decrypt it and give, give us all your data that is on it. Uh, well, I didn't give it away. Uh, and it, they tried to decrypt it for, I think, four months and they were not successful. Uh, so yeah, uh, be... Uh, even if you ha are doing nothing wrong, uh, you could be a target for, for someone. You, you, might become, uh, you might be placed in a position which you don't want to be placed in. So let's see how it works with the VPN. So when you send the request, when you, when you are connected to the VPN, uh, you can imagine a, a tunnel is created between you and the VPN service provider that a secure tunnel, and only you and the VPN provider knows what's happening inside it. The ISP, in this case, the only information that the internet service provider sees is that you send some kind of request to the VPN service. They don't know that you send it to the Google or, or you downloaded anything or you, 
whatever happened, right? The, the only thing they know, there was some kind of communication through the VPN server. And that's all they see. Um, it's important to, to carefully choose your VPN provider because what you are essentially doing when you're, when you're connected to the VPN is that you are transferring your trust from your internet service provider to the VPN provider. Uh, so you have to find one that, that says that they, they have no login policy. Uh, it's important that they don't keep any logs. Uh, of, your, of your visits. Uh, it is also important that it has been audited externally to verify the claims that they are making. If they're making that they keep no logs, well, they should be open to the audit and the audit should verify that it actually is the case. It's also important to, for, for that provider to be based in a country that has good privacy and data retention laws. Such countries are, for example, Switzerland and Sweden, and, and you can see two examples here, two VPN providers, Mulvad, which is based in Sweden, and ProtonVPN, which is based in Switzerland, and both of these countries have good privacy laws, and both of these VPN providers are, have been externally audited, and they, they have no logs policy, uh, and in a good country. Uh, and one last point is that your VPN provider may ask you for your personal information to sign you up on the service. Uh, that is the case, for example, for the majority of VPNs, and it also is the case for Proton VPN. They ask for your uh, uh, email address and your password, uh, and that is a personally identifiable information that can be linked to you. So. Uh, it's better if there's nothing at all that, that is linked to you. For example, Moveout will not ask for any kind of personal information. They will just generate a random number for your account and you can use that random number as your username. Um, and you can also pay with cryptocurrency so that there's no uh, payment details stored on the same server as well. If they have, again, if they have nothing, they can share nothing. Um, so it's a good idea to secure all your devices using a, a network level VPN connection. By default, what most people are doing is, and what most VPN providers are providing is, uh, they, they are giving you applications that you can install on your phones, on your laptops, that you can use to connect to the VPN service. But there are some devices, for example, IoT devices, like smart fridges, smart, um, uh, I don't know, uh, vacuum cleaners, robot vacuum cleaners. Uh, uh, there are also um, washing machines that are connected to your Wi-Fi. Um, and you cannot install a VPN application on the washing machine or, or a fridge. So it is important, well, first of all, don't buy a fridge that has a wireless connection. You don't need it. Uh, and uh, But if you do buy it, for example, I do have a vacuum cleaner that needs a wireless connection, right? It's a robot vacuum cleaner. and uh, it, it, what I did is I just blocked internet access, access to it. It cannot access internet, it can just access the wireless connection. Um, but it's also important that if you want to give uh, that access to the device, for example, you might have a Google Home, right? And there's also a, a, a device, I don't want to mention her name, it's owned by Amazon. Um, and uh, you can, if, if you have those, they will, they will need internet connection and Without a network level VPN connection, they will give uh, give away your your IP address, and they will give uh, and ISP will also see that you're using those services. You can also check uh, Mozilla Foundation's privacy not included. You can search for this, uh, and it's it's a it's a list of um, devices that you that are good for your privacy. They respect your privacy. Uh, if, for example, if you're shopping for a smart device, an IoT device for your home, you can always check Mozilla Foundation's list if it's in there, and if they are sharing any kind of information with the, uh, to the third parties, if they are uh, storing your information on the cloud, or if it's local and all various things. So check out the check out this this page and. Um, let it be guide for you when you're shopping those devices. So it's also a good idea to route your mobile devices through your home network. So whenever, when you are creating the uh, 
uh, entire network connection, uh, entire network VPN connection through your router on your home, what you can do is also to make your router to act as a VPN server. And what you will do on your phones is you will connect to your router, your home router, and the your, your mobile phone will go through VPN at all times. You don't have to remember to turn on the VPN application. And for example, when you're turning on the device, before you turn on the application, you might leak some data. You might, that device can send some requests and then leak your personal information. Um, so network level VPN uh, allows you to secure any device, including your fridge. Uh, and, and there are various uh, open source software that you can use to, to do that. There is PFSense, uh, there is OpenSense. Both of these are uh, free and open source applications that you can use to create your own router. And it's not very complicated. There are guides for, for it. There are guides for you to install this in, in specific devices. And to configure the VPNs, there are tons of guides online for that. And But you'll have to uh, buy some devices. There are PFSense routers that the company themselves, that they sell it. And there are Protectly devices that you can use as a router and you can install your own open source uh, firmware there. Um, and there are also tiny, tiny generic VPN routers that you can use. Uh, you can just throw in the uh, VPN configuration in there. And whenever you're traveling, for example, you can connect to that. It will give you a wireless access point that will always go through uh, a VPN. Um, so we we can also we we talked about how we are hiding the information from our ISP or the websites that we that we visit in, but we can also restrict some websites to talk to malicious actors or 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 um, uh, domains that that are used for tracking our information for for example for stealing our browser fingerprints or uh, uh, to target better ads for us, right? They're, they're using our information to generate better ads, and they're also using it for uh, for tracking us across the web, how we are navigating. For example, if you have, um, if you were shopping for something, right? Let's say an example, a vacuum cleaner. So you might see that the uh, the advertisements that you will receive on other websites could be vacuum cleaners. Now, some of that can be confirmation bias, so you're seeing what you think you're seeing, but uh, if, if uh, for example, that comes from Facebook or Google, they, will, they are actually using your browsing data, browser history, uh, to, uh, to target better ads and to create that. So you are being tracked, your interests are being tracked, and there is a way to block that. And it is called PyHole. PyHole is uh, an open source application uh, that you can install on your uh, to act as a as a DNS. So DNS stands for Domain Names Service. Uh, and how it works is, for example, when you're making a request from uh, your browser, um, internet in the internet we cannot talk with with names, right? We cannot say. Uh, give me facebook.com and we cannot uh, that doesn't go through the through the pipes right through the internet pipes so what has to happen is that we have to have some kind of translation system that will translate the domain name to an IP address of the server that we're trying to access so when we're sending for example tracking domain.com to the browser browser secretly asks the DNS service all right give me that IP address it's a phone book basically right and the DNS server will will give the browser the IP address and then the browser will proceed to access that domain um, now what happens if we place pihole in front of it well Pi-hole, what, what Pi-hole does, it intercepts the DNS request that any of your device is making on your network, your browsers, your, your phone applications, uh, uh, or, or, or anything else. And what it tries to do is, well, let's say you visit NewYorkTimes.com, and NewYorkTimes and, and we, we request this information to Pi-hole. Pi-hole will check whether or not NewYorkTimes.com is, is in the blacklist. It, it will see that it's not. It's a genuine website. It's not used for tracking. And it will ask the DNS server to, to give me your IP address, and it will turn it, uh, send it back to the browser, and we can access the website after that. Now, 
New York Times, in the background, when you load the web page, it can load the uh, tracking scripts from third-party companies that provide the tracking uh, for New York Times, right, to, to track their customers, to log their visits, and, and uh, store their information. And let's say, let's suppose that there is a tracking domain.com uh, that is doing this. It's loaded in the background, and when we say, when, when that's loaded in the background, it sends this uh, request to Pi-hole, and Pi-hole will check it whether it's on blacklist. It will see yes, that's in the black, blacklist, and Pi-hole will be like, I have no idea what you're asking for. I, I don't know where it's hosted, I can't give you an IP address of that, and what it will do is actually it will send the IP address of itself, so the browser, instead of talking directly to the tra tracking domain.com, it will talk to Pi-hole, and Pi-hole will say, all right, well, I received your request, but that's it, I'm not doing anything else. So this way, uh, if there are trackers uh, in your home network, anything, any of these trackers will be blocked. And what's good about it is that it can run on any device. If you have an old computer laying around in your home, you can install Pi-hole in it, and it's very simple to do. You just follow the instructions on the website, and you just change some settings on your router to point to the Pi-hole server that you installed, and it works, and it requires uh, it requires almost no resources to do that. Now, we're we're talking about securing our data from external actors, but we have to also secure our own devices, even if they are not leaving, um, even if we are not sharing this information externally online. Uh, and I strongly believe that. Our devices, uh, our phones, our laptops are extension of ourselves. Uh, I think, well, do you remember what you did on Random Friday in 2015? Uh, you probably don't. Your brain forgets things, but your device does not. Cloud does not forget anything. It, it knows exactly, for example, if you had a tracking uh, uh, at that time, if, if the, you had geolocation enabled, your uh, device knows where you have been in, since you had that phone, or before if you had a different phone connected to the same, for example, Google account, and you stored the location information, your phone knows it more about you than you do. So if you're not comfortable with someone saying, someone coming to you and asking, well, can you give me access to your brain? Can I pick through your brain and see everything that is inside you? If that's giving you chills, then someone going through your phone should give, be, give you even more chills because it's, it's scary. It, it will access, it will let someone um, to access your entire life probably. Um, and, and encryption is a way to protect all your data uh, so that nobody can do that. Uh, and it's crucially important that all of your devices where your data is stored, your, where your personal data is stored, are encrypted. Uh, now, newer Androids and iOS devices, newer, I mean, from 2018 probably, 2017, uh, they are encrypted by default, but I'll just check it uh, anyway. Uh, so you're pretty safe there. but. The, the only default that, that the only bad thing about it is that they are using a bad default, right? Most of us are using uh, just digit four digit pins or six digit pins on our devices, and it's not very secure. Um, breaking the four digit uh, uh, passcode is very simple, but device um, device manufacturers are using protection against this but it's a software and sometimes hardware protection. So what happens is that, for example, if you have a four-digit pin, what your iOS device, for example, will do is whenever tr someone tries to brute force all the possible combinations of a password, of a four-digit password, what will happen is that they will start with 0000, right? And then if that's incorrect, it will, uh, it will say, all right, you have another, another attempt. It will give the user three attempts, and after a while, it starts increasing the time it's, it, it, you need to wait before you try for another password. And that time is increasing. And by, I think, by thir uh, the, the request number 30, uh, by incorrect att attempt number 30, uh, it will take, I think, weeks or months for, for, they have to wait for months until they can try again. And that will increase even more. And at some point, it will just be blocked uh, altogether. 
but that is a uh, uh, software protection and and software has bugs software has issues so uh, y it is possible for someone to find a hole in that system and they they might find a way to just go through all possible combinations and if they are successful in that what will happen is that they will just break your phone in less than a second um so it's important you use alphanumeric password instead of a simple pin. Uh, uh, something with more than nine characters is good enough, but I understand that none of us is going to be entering nine alphanumeric characters on their phone every time they want to unlock their phones. And it's also not a good thing to do, especially publicly, because, well, there could be cameras around and they could just uh, see what you just entered and then use that information against you. So use biometrics. Use biometrics whenever you are trying to uh, access your data without your password and when you want convenience. Now, biometrics are um, are creating a, a, are, are not very secure in a sense that if somebody was to take your phone away when it was turned on, they can force you to give up your biometrics. They can force you to use your fingerprint to unlock the device, or they can just point it at your face and unlock the device and access the data on it. But well, simple solution to that is that when you feel that you're at risk, just turn off your phone. Whenever the phone is turned off, uh, the reason why you cannot use biometrics or your, your fingerprint or your face is because it needs a password, it needs a key to the, to the encryption, uh, for the encryption to unlock it and, and decrypt all the files. When your phone is turned on, it's no longer encrypted. All of that, uh, so it's decrypted at that time, and your key is stored in a memory of your device. So if were, someone was to take your phone away when it was turned on, they could just read through the memory and, and find the, what the key is. There are protections, but as I said, protections can, can have bugs that even manufacturer doesn't know about. Um, Let's go through the desktop, desktop operating systems, right? If you're using Windows or Mac OS, there are ways for you to, to encrypt those too. Uh, and it's important for you to use full disk encryption. There are various types of disk encryptions in operating systems. Some of the encryptions are encrypting only the volumes on your uh, hard drive, right? For example, if you are a Windows user, you might recognize them as C and D drives, right? The defaults that Windows creates. And a C is operating system, D is your media files or other things. Um, so the, the software could provide you a way to protect a single volume or your entire hard drive. Now, it's better to do the, the, the full disk encryption because, uh, well, nobody can do anything with that hard drive. Nobody, for example, it's better for your entire drive to be encrypted, for your entire data to, to be encrypted rather than leave spaces where you can also just leave unencrypted files that you can forget about. Or you may not think that they are important, but in, it turned out that they are, so it's better to do the, the first. And use a strong passphrase. Um, and you might believe, you might think that using passwords such as random gibberish that you cannot remember, such as the second uh, password sample there, uh, that, that could be secure, but it's not because it's very hard to remember this. If you forget your encryption password, then you cannot access your devices anymore. You need something that is easy to remember and that is strong enough. And just generating six random words will give you enough protection from that and will, will be easy to remember. Let's say we have a clapping aerobics in two whimsical precincts. It doesn't make any sense, but we can remember it. If we write it, uh, if we write it down uh, uh, often enough, then we, at some point we'll just remember it. Um, you can use, uh, but it's, it's important for you to use random words. Your, brain, your brains are not very random. They're not good at generating random information. You have biases that, that, will, uh, that will affect the random words that you're thinking of. So it's, it's a good idea to use external tools such as password managers to generate those for you. Uh, Built-in file vaults in macOS is good enough. It is closed source, but there are no better alternatives that I know of that you can use there. And it is good enough, but make sure that iCloud backup of your key is turned off. Because the, 
when, when you're encrypted your, your Mac OS device, uh, Apple will ask you, the system will ask you whether or not you want to store your key in the iCloud backup. And if, that's, if you do that, then Apple has a way to, uh, to decrypt your drive. They can, the government can come knocking to Apple asking for that encryption key and they will just give it away. If, well, if the government asks them uh, for long enough with, with enough dedication. Um, there is also Veracrypt in Windows. It has been audited. It's, it, it is based in, on TrueCrypt that has been there for, for years. Uh, it's a free and open source uh, software that can encrypt uh, your full, your entire disk and give you the ability to uh, secure even the, the operating system, system drive. Um, so when we're, uh, it's important for you to use random username and random passwords anywhere. Not just passwords, you have to, you probably know that you have to be using different passwords on every application that you sign up on. But it's also important for you to use different usernames on those websites. And the password manager will give you that, that option. Password managers have a way to generate passphrases that you can use as usernames. Because if you don't do that, and for example, if you sign up on one website and you use the same username anywhere, everywhere, and then you also use your full name there, they, then I can find you. Then I can, uh, I can find all of your accounts on all of your social networks, right? Maybe you're, you have a Reddit account with the same username that you have on the, some kind of forum. Maybe you have hobbies that you don't want people to know about. And if you use the same username, then I can just link it to you. You're not very anonymous in that case. But if you use different usernames, well, you, you have a higher anonymity uh, on the websites that you're using. And, and there are two free and open source uh, uh, password managers that you can use for to save that, to save all of your passwords, to generate the passwords for you and enter them uh, automatically in all of your applications or your websites that you're visiting is KeePassXC and Bitwarden. Both of you, both of these, uh, give you the way to uh, to do this. Um, you, and you can, for example. Uh, you can use Dropbox for synchronizing this database across multiple devices. Now, Dropbox will have access to your database, but as your database is encrypted with your password, it's okay to share that with Dropbox because Dropbox cannot see what's inside of it without our password that only we can know. Um, another important thing for you to do uh, is to Anywhere where you see two-factor authentication offered, you have to enable it. Yeah, whether it's Google, it's, it's your email, it's your Facebook account, or any account that has two-factor authentication, you have to enable it. But remember that SMS is not a good 2FA. So SMS can be intercepted. SMS can be read by your network provider. Uh, it also can be read, it is also stored in logs, so the government can ask for, uh, um, for all incoming SMS that the user receives and they just can log into your account. A good alternative to that is the applications that generate uh, uh, random digits for you every 30 seconds and, and those are TOEFL for iOS and IGS Authenticator, Authenticator for Android. Both of these are open source tools and you can use them to, to uh, add different accounts to them and then generate passcodes with that. Um, so you also want to frequently search your username and your full name online and, and uh, see what appears. You might forget that you have some social network that you created years ago that you are sharing some personal personal information there. That maybe you have some old photos there that you don't want to be seen by the public. Uh, and Or maybe someone stole your identity and is pretending to be you. Or maybe you have some kind of account on some forum that you had some interest in but you no longer do that and you don't want public to know about it. Search for your username frequently. Have a schedule. Do it every couple of months uh, and just see what, what, turn, what, what your search results are and then just visit every single website and ask the owners just to remove your account. Or if you have a possibility, just change the username to a random one so that you're not identifiable anymore. 
and after GDPR, the use legislation for, for bare privacy, uh, uh, a lot of websites do have a way for you to ask for removal of the information because GDPR forces every uh, owner of every, every application, whether it's a phone application or web application, to have a way for, for it to remove the data of EU citizens. So they, they frequently apply that to everyone. That is probably, uh, you can, even though you're not a EU citizen, you can request data to be removed uh, anyway. Uh, and what about the messages that we've sent when we were 10 years older than we are now? Uh, I, for example, when I look at those messages, I don't want them to be anywhere or identified or linked to me. Uh, and that, as years ago go by, I think the same about every message that I'm sending right now. So, that, and that will be the case for your entire life. You will change your... Uh, how you behave, what you, are to, what you are talking about, how you are talking, right? Who you are talking to, the people will come and go from your life and you may want to uh, remove the information that you shared with, per, with other people uh, from Facebook. Now, Facebook's privacy policy and terms of conditions state that uh, if you deactivate your account or delete your account, your data is only removed if it's not uh, necessary for Facebook to function properly. So what does it mean? Well, let's say you sent that data, uh, sent a message to your friend. For Facebook, uh, if they remove the messages that you have sent, that means that the other, other person will not be able to use the Facebook as it's intended because they will not be able to read the message anymore. But there is a, a way for you to unsend messages on Facebook. And when you do that, uh, it is removed from the recipient's uh, uh, messenger. Uh, and while we don't really know whether or not it's removed from Facebook servers, we can, well, at least be sure that it's removed from the recipient. It's not shared with them first. And second, if Facebook, Facebook is probably waiting for some kind of lawsuit if they are not deleting the messages that have been unsent because neither me or the recipient has the message, so it's not required for, for Facebook to pro function properly, so they have to delete it. And Facebook says that they delete it in within 90 days after that happens, but we have to trust them. So trusting them is the only option that we have, unfortunately. Don't use Facebook Messenger for your communication, just use Signal. But if you happen to have to use that in the past, there is a browser extension that can automate this process for you. It's called Shoot the Messenger. You can install that on Chrome. And what will happen is that you, you navigate to messenger.com, open the thread that you want to, to nuke, and it will go through every single message that you that is there and it will unsend it and it will be deleted from everyone's, everyone's device. And same goes for Instagram. There's an um, Instagram helper script that you can use uh, that will do the same thing for Instagram. Now, in summary, let's sum this up. Right? Um, so use browsers that protect you against fingerprinting. Um, use trusted and audited VPNs that secure, uh, to secure your network connection uh, from ISP and, and web, web applications. Encrypt your entire home network traffic with VPN. Use open source on and end-to-end -end encrypted software for any kind of communication. Uh, use Pi-hole to block ads. Uh, treat your devices as an extension of yourself, and I cannot stress this enough. Your devices are an extension of yourself. Your data is you, and whatever you are keeping on those devices is part of you, so treat them with care. Uh, encrypt all your devices with passphrase and never store encryption key in the cloud. Uh, use passwords to managers to generate random usernames and secure passwords and just have a schedule that you remove your data frequently. Um, and that's it. Um, do you have any questions? Thank you so much, Georgi. <clears throat> so in case you, hold on. So in case uh, our Zoom participants have any questions, they can use chat uh, and I will read them out loud. In case you have some questions, then I can give you some, like, but oh, there is a question. Hold on, hold on. Hi, 
Uh, the, my name is Lucas. Thank you for the presentation. It was really, really interesting. Um, in myself, I work a lot by doing web scraping and trying to connect, for example, through R, connecting to other websites. And I also can imagine other cases where I can I have to enter the internet without having to go through the, through the browser. And in my case, I work in security elements. So how do I secure my blueprint when using, for example, R or using uh, Postman or et cetera, in order to like secure who am I we we web scraping does know that I am who is doing it. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. So I do a web scraping as well. And uh, to explain to, to I, I guess you all know what web, web scraping is, uh, but it's just uh, accessing the information from various web, web applications or not just web applications, APIs, using automated tools. Uh, so in case of web scraping, so if you use a network level VPN connection, right, any of your tools that you're using, if you're using Python, if you're using R, any of your tools that are connected to your home network, they are also will also go through your VPN provider. There are also tools uh, that you can use, for example, if you want to uh, randomize your IP address in there, you can use tools to, you can, you can create proxies that you yourself own. For example, there are applications on Google Cloud that you can generate as many proxies, as many IP addresses as you want, and you, that will make your communication secure, and it will give you, uh, well, it will give you ability to send more requests to the website that you're scraping. Uh, it will, yeah, and it will protect your information from the ISP. But if you just use the uh, default, uh, if you secure the uh, connection on the router level, right, you, you install OpenVPN configuration file from your VPN provider on your router, then all of your rec requests from your devices will go through that by default, so you don't have to make any kind of adjustments in your application. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, my, my name is Alice. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question regarding um, defining or uh, finding the people uh, by the size of traffic, for instance. Yeah, uh, I know some cases yeah. in Belarus, for instance, when uh, some people in the night uh, posted uh, pictures. Yeah, with for for instance size of uh, ten kilobytes. Yeah, uh, even using VPN, and then uh, special forces found them and arrested. Actually, uh, how to yeah, how to be safe in such case, for uh, instance? And so maybe do you know something about it? About uh, finding the people by the size of traffic? Yeah. Uh, well, it could be possible, right? So your ISP can log all your, of your traffic and all of your requests when you're making the request to the VPN server, VPN service, and if you are secured by the, by, by the VPN, they will, can see the sizes of your packets that you're sending. But um, there are ways to protect, uh, from, to protect yourself from that. So whenever you are using VPN, the, your ISP, your internet service provider, knows that you're using VPN. What you can do is, for example, Movat has shadow socks proxies. And what that does, it, it uh, simulates your traffic as if, if it was just HTTPS traffic as you were visiting uh, Facebook, for example, and it will not be, it will be indistinguishable from the normal traffic. So the, the ISP will not know that you're using VPN, so they will not have uh, a reason to do that. Now, obviously, if you're not doing that, they can see the packets, uh, they can see the packet sizes, but I think that, uh, well, if, if someone, if there's a, if, size of the request is enough uh, to to prosecute someone in a country, I don't think that you're safe from anything because that's not a good evidence. So that's probably just a reason, right? They could say that you are used VPN and they could arrest you. So, well, there, there are no good solutions to that. Uh, you can, you can use different protections to, to just, you know, increase the sizes of your requests uh, or, or simulate them so that they, are, they look normal. But if they, will, they want to come up to you, for example, in Belarus, they probably will. If you're targeted at individual level uh, in a country that is a dictatorship, that somebody will definitely come to you 
and nothing will protect you. <laughs> you just need to run away. Uh, any more questions? Um, I will read out loud the Zoom question and I will be back to you. So what is the difference privacy-wise um, in using Google DNS server versus our ISP DNS? Um, so we are, when we're using Google DNS server, we are trusting that Google is, um, that, that Google will, Google is better for our privacy that, uh, than our ISP. But actually, uh, since all of the DNS requests, the translation of domains into IP addresses by default are not encrypted, the ISP can actually see anything that, that any kind of DNS communication, even if we use Google, our ISP can see what, what we requested from the DNS server because it's not encrypted. It's sent in the clear. But um, ISPs, usually uh, use their DNS servers to block some websites. Uh, uh, they, they, they will, for example, if government asks the ISP to, all right, block the uh, Facebook, right? They will just remove the entry from their DNS, uh, DNS list and Facebook will, not, will no longer be accessible. In case of Google, well, they don't do that kind of stuff. The Facebook will, will be still there and it will still be accessible. Uh, but there are better ways, better alternatives to that. There is Quad9 uh, DNS that is privacy-centric. They, they are better than Google. They, they give you better privacy. They don't, don't keep any logs. And if you are using Pi-hole and you want that information, that DNS request to be secure, what you can do is also use DNS over HTTPS or uh, secure uh, or TLS that will basically protect the entire communication, the entire DNS request from the ISP as well. So to answer the main question, well, there are some differences that ISP can remove some entries from DNS. Google does not really do that. Uh, but in terms of privacy, both of those are not good choices, really. Uh, you're better off sticking with Quad9 and, and Pi-hole uh, in front of it. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you very much for your presentation. So you just recently mentioned an example with the robot uh, vacuum cleaners, and I just got uh, an advertisement to buy it. Uh, interesting is that, for example, last time I was talking to my friend about one person, and next day I see that this person in the like as a suggestion in my Facebook. So how we can protect ourselves from this? So what about the voice data? How we can I mean prevent it? Thank you. That's a very good question. So what um, I think that when you talked with your friends, uh, I think that, well, our first idea, our, f our first guess when we see something like that happen is to that Facebook is listening to our conversations. Uh, but that's not actually true. There, there haven't been cases where uh, we we haven't seen any kind of communication from Facebook where they unsolicitedly record our uh, uh, our voices, right? Our, uh, our our talks, and you can also remove the permission on your device for Facebook to use your microphone. And, and if that's removed, then it's impossible for Facebook unless they hack through the phone and and, and uh, find the bugs in it and and just do that anyway, well, it's not worth it for them. That would be a huge PR scandal for Facebook, so they will probably not do that. What, what I think can, how this can be explained is, I think, very simple. So it's probably, it's my guess, because we don't really know. Some of it is explained by confirmation bias. You might have seen the, uh, the vacuum cleaner advertisements before as well, but because you never thought about them, you might not remember that you've seen them. Now that you bought it, you probably are close and paying close attention to it. But it's not just confirmation bias. What could also happen is that, for example, you might search when you bought it, you were searching for it on online, right? And Facebook could, could, could read that data. You might have visited some vacuum cleaner websites and there was a Facebook tracking pixel on that website. So Facebook knows that you are interested in vacuum cleaners. And then Facebook could also track your uh, geolocation, right? They can, if that's enabled on your device, they can track your geolocation. And if, you, if your friend also has that enabled, or if you, if you connect to their wireless network, they can 
uh, they can understand, they can know or assume that you are at your friend's place. And if Facebook knows, for example, that you've, you've bought a vacuum cleaner or you're searching for it, they could think that you would probably talk about it with your friends. It's highly likely that, that you would. Uh, and if that's the case, then they will continue showing you the ads of the vacuum cleaner. So that's how it can be explained. It's probably your browsing history, not your conversation with your friend. Uh, thank you. A question from Slack, uh, from Elena Darjania. Uh, beyond Facebooks and corporate platforms, how to find the right balance between what data government should acquire for decision making and what we should keep private? Um, well, I think government. Um, I think government has no place in people's private data um, at all. Uh, I don't think there's so if if the government needs some kind of our private data to function, for example, our ID number or our full full names or our address to send us uh, 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 send us mail, right? They they can have that, or or for for tax purposes they can have that. But except from this, except for this information, a very basic private information, I don't think that government needs to collect any kind of personal information of its citizens. They simply don't have any place, any reason to do that. If the person committed a crime uh, and government wants to read through their devices, well, if the person didn't encrypt their devices, well, it's their fault, so government can re and will read through that data. Um, I think it's wrong still, because I think that committing a crime does not mean access to your entire brain. Uh, so, well, government can collect all kind of public information that is accessible for the users for their own purposes if they want to, but I think that that's, that's the right balance right there, just collects what's necessary. Thank you. Any, Any more, more questions? questions? All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah. Thank you.